Um, so, hi everyone, my name is YY. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, so, Bahar, um, as Bahar mentioned, um, Safan and I were going to be co-presenting today. Um, I will be taking the lead for the first half of the presentation and um, pass the mic to Safan afterwards. Um, before getting started, I just want to make sure that everyone is aware of this. Um, Safan and I um, are not employees of either the Immigration, Refugee, or, and Citizenship Canada or Medivy Blue Cross, which is the insurance company that has been contracted by the federal government to run the interim federal health program. So, um, you know, with that in mind, although the, during the course of today's presentation, uh, we might from time to time provide you with some tips um, in terms of how to navigate the interim federal health program. These tips are based on our personal experiences as people who have worked um, in this field, um, who have had to deal with IVHP over the years. And these are not um, and should not be taken as official policies or advice from either the IRCC or Medivy Blue Cross. And so having said that, um, here again is just a quick um, overview in terms of how um, Sifan and I are going to divide up our presentations. Again, I will uh, start the presentation today by um, offering you a bird's eye view of the interim federal health program. I will begin by placing the IFHP uh, within the historical context, right? including uh, briefly walking you through some of the changes that were made to the program in recent years. Then, as you probably would have um, expected from a, a lawyer, uh, I will draw your attention to the uh, current interim federal health program policy with a view to give you a general idea of whom the IVHP covers and what it covers. Having laid out the IVHP and what it's supposed to look like on paper, um, I would then wrap up my part of the presentation by sharing with you some preliminary results from a research study that I've been leading over the past few years, which explored um, the on the ground experiences of both health service providers and service users in their encounter with the IFHP. Now, after that, again, I will pass um, the microphone to Safan, who will offer a closer look at the, the nuts and bolts of how to work with the IFHP. And so among other things, she will touch on the administrative aspect of the IFHP, including how service providers may enroll in the program, um, how they can figure out which specific healthcare procedures or um, devices um, are covered, so where to find that information, and how to submit claims and receive reimbursements for services rendered. She will also give a few updates on what service providers and clients should be aware of when interacting with the IFHP during the current pandemic. And, and finally, she will offer some tips on how service providers could do a better job um, in, in supporting uh, clients and facilitating their entitlement uh, and access to IFHP. And so that's in a nutshell how we um, intend to proceed today. So let me just begin by giving you a bit of the historical background. The Interim Federal Health Program, as many of you know, is a federally run healthcare program for many refugees and refugee claimants and other uh, individuals who are in similar situations here in Canada. In practice, the management of the IVHP, the day-to-day -day operation of that program is contracted out by the government um, to a private health insurance company, and that company currently is the uh, Medivy Blue Cross. Okay, so those will be the, the people that many of you will, will probably um, come in contact with uh, if, if you work in this field. Now, while the Canadian 
government has had a long history in providing publicly subsidized health care to migrants, including refugees and refugee claimants. The modern iteration of the IFHP really was introduced um, around 1994, 1995. And since then, for, you know, since that point in time, for about um, over a decade, the interim federal health program provided basic coverage um, to refugees, refugee claimants, and other similarly situated migrants who are not eligible for provincial or territorial health insurance. And by basic coverage, generally speaking, what we're referring to are things that are similar to um, those health services that are covered by provincial or territorial insurance plans. The program also covered the cost of certain supplemental care, right? So akin to what low income people or people living with disabilities may receive in some provinces or territories through their social assistance program. And these will include such things as um, essential prescription drugs, basic vision care, um, emergency dental treatment, long-term care, home care, and so forth. Okay. And such supplemental coverage was typically given for only one year if we're talking about um, um, refugee claimant, uh, sorry, refugees, right? We settled refugees. Um, okay, so, so that's how the program started. And again, for about two decades, and that was how the IFHP um, worked. But things changed all of a sudden in June 2012. Um, now, the, the detail of that policy change back in 2012 was extremely complicated. Um, so I wouldn't go into it right now. Um, but in a nutshell, certain newcomers, including some refugees and refugee claimants that used to qualify for the IFHP would no longer qualify since June 2012. And among those who maintained their eligibility, many saw their, the, the scope of their healthcare coverage under the IFHP significantly uh, reduced. The revised IFHP introduced in 2012 was so confusing that there were frequent stories out in the news um, about newcomers being turned away um, while seeking services that they were in fact entitled to. Um, so dissatisfied with, with those cuts to the interim federal health program, a group of doctors working with lawyers and migrant advocates um, decided to take the government to court. And in July 2014, the federal court ruled in favor of the doctors and their allies and struck down the revised interim federal health program as cruel and unusual and therefore unconstitutional. And finally, in April 2016, under the, the current Trudeau government, the interim federal health program was reinstated for the most part back to what it used to look like prior to June 2012. And finally, starting in April 2017, the interim federal health program was further expanded to um, cover the cost of some pre-departure medical services for settled refugees. And we'll talk about what that looked like. Okay. And so hopefully, you know, that in, a, in those two slides, hopefully that give you some background to how we got to where we are today uh, with respect to the IFHP. Now, let me say a bit more about whom and what the IFHP actually covers. Okay. Um, according to the current interim federal health program policy, the program aims to provide limited temporary co uh, coverage of healthcare costs for the following um, groups of people. Resettled refugees, refugee claimants, victims of human trafficking, and certain in immigration detainees. Okay, and so for those of you who who um, are wondering, resettled refugees um, are those 
refugees who came to Canada through government assistance or private sponsorship or a combination of both. And so for those group of people, we know that they're refugee to begin with, right? So they're brought to Canada as refugees and that differentiate them from refugee claimants who come to Canada and make a claim saying that they are refugees, but those claims um, need to be uh, adjudicated by um, the Immigration Refugee Board. Okay. And so those four groups of people are supposed to be covered under the IFHP. Now, the presentation that Sven and I are going to be given today will focus on the first two group of those people, so resettled refugees and refugee claimants. And so for those two populations, what are their entitlement under the IFHP and how long do they have IFHP coverage for? Well, let's start with the um, refugee claimants. These individuals, um, they are entitled to receive both basic and supplemental coverage. Now again, basic coverage is similar to um, what people will receive under provincial and territorial health insurance claims. And supplemental coverage, on the other hand, includes um, those services or, or medical devices that are typically received by social assistance recipients in provinces or territories. Now, in addition to those two types of coverage, right, basic and supplemental coverage, refugee claimants are also entitled to have the cost of their immigration medical exams covered under the IHP. Now, generally speaking, refugee claimants eligibility for the IFHP starts as soon as they make a refugee claim, either at the border or inside Canada at an IRCC office. And so as soon as they, they, they you know, say, make a claim that they want to um, apply for a refugee status, that should be the trigger for their interim federal health eligibility. The coverage will last until one of the following three things happens. Okay. So the coverage could last until refugee claimants qualify for provincial or territorial health insurance, or 90 days after their refugee claim was found successful and therefore they um, become protected persons in Canada, or in the event that their refugee claim is unsuccessful, then the IHP will end on the day that they're scheduled to be removed from Canada. Okay, so those are the three potential end dates for refugee claimants. Now, let me just give you an example specifically um, for, for um, our, those of you in the audience who are from BC, right? So if your refugee claimants were living in BC, um, according to BC's um, law, um, refugee claimants would be eligible for the medical services plan, right? BC's um, provincial health insurance once they receive a work permit and have become a resident of BC. That is much more generous than some other provinces such as Ontario where I live in. And so, so in that situation, if you're a refugee claimant, you have apply for a work permit and you have been successfully given work permit, you actually be covered under the provincial health insurance plan in BC. And so if that happens, then you will no longer have the basic coverage under the IFHP because again, that will be covered by the provincial health insurance in BC. What they will get is the supplemental portion of the interim federal health program. Right, so that's the situation for refugee claimants. Now let's look at resettled refugees coverage under the IHP. As mentioned, since April 2017, resettled refugees are now entitled to receive certain pre-departure medical services before they even arrive in Canada. And so these are things, um, you know, coverages for such things as immigration medical exam that these um, refugees will have to do while they're abroad, or vaccinations, um, or sometimes some treatment for communicable diseases 
um, that you know, they may experience an outbreak in uh, refugee camps, transit centers, or temporary sh um, settlements. Um, so, so those are some of the things that are covered under the Department of Medical Services. Once they arrive in Canada, resettled refugees are typically only eligible for the supplemental coverage portion of the IFHP and only for, for one year. Again, that's because they typically will receive um, the basic coverage portion through their uh, provincial or territorial health insurance. Now, notably, according to the current interfederal health um, policy, the immigration minister um, actually also has the discretion to provide healthcare coverage to people facing quote unquote exceptional and compelling circumstances, right, beyond those groups that I just mentioned. However, it remains largely a mystery at this time um, how people can actually apply to have the minister exercise that discretion. Right? So in theory, it's possible, but we don't quite know what's the process um, to, to trigger that exercise of discretion on the part of the minister. All right, so um, again, yeah, I'm happy to do the Q&A. I know that I'm kind of just going at a very high level here. Okay, um, so having laid out the individual health program in terms of what it's supposed to look like and how it's supposed to work on paper. For the rest of my presentation, I want to shift gears and really focus on how the individual health program is actually experienced by people on the front lines. And specifically, I'd like to share with you some preliminary results from a pair of um, research studies that I've been conducting um, that explored both service providers and service users' experiences with the interim federal health program. Since um, 2017, my research team have interviewed a total of 20 interim federal health clients and 30 health service providers who are located in Ottawa and in Toronto. And so by health um, service providers, um, what I'm referring to and those that we have interviewed include medical doctors, nurses, um, dentists, optometrists, physiotherapists, um, mental health counselors, health navigators, and um, administrators of some clinics or, or healthcare programs. And so in short, what we found was that Although the interim federal health program has served the needs of many refugees and refugee claimants. So, you know, for some participants, their experience with interim federal health was quite positive. Having said that, for some other people, certain gaps continue to exist, um, both in terms of the IVHP coverage and service access under the program. And so I will start with um, just elaborating on the complaints concerning the gaps in the IVHP coverage. So in our interviews with service providers, we have heard that some refugees and certain members of their families left out under the current um, For example, prior to 2012, the interim federal health program used to cover dependent children of refugees or refugee claimants, uh, even if those children were born in Canada and therefore citizens by birth. However, under the current IVHP, these Canadian-born children to refugee parents are not eligible for IVHP coverage. And although these children may be entitled to receiving provincial or territorial health insurance. Instead, we know that in some provinces or territories, um, the public insurance plan do not really cover um, some of the things that IVHP does cover under its supplemental coverage, right? Um, prescription drugs being, being one of those, um, the major ones. And so that means that in the same refugee family, 
Um, you could have the parents covered um, for supplemental care under the FHP, but not their Canadian born children, right? Who were left out of that, that coverage. Um, so I don't know if Stefan, you want to say a bit more about this point? Um, I think I'd just add that um, just an example of uh, clients that we were helping, a single mother that came to Canada had a child born here. Um, and then the child actually needed medication because of the complications at birth and the mother couldn't afford it. So pre 2012, the mother's IFHP would have covered prescription medication, but now it's not covered. So we had to get creative and you'll, you'll hear a lot more in my presentation of the different tips, but um, we had to get creative and talk to include the settlement worker for the client as well as the immigration officer and we were able to kind of negotiate um, an increase in funding for the mother so we applied for a special diet allowance um, and then that sort of helped cover the cost of the medications but um, it is unfortunate and YY and I have raised it with IRCC about this issue but we haven't been uh, lucky to reverse that change back to 2012, what it was before 2012. So there are gonna be gaps like that, but like YY said, there could be workarounds, um, talking to the minister, talking to immigration officers to see how uh, we can still provide some support to the clients. Great, thank you. Um, and then, you know, besides Canadian children born to refugee parents, um, another thing that we've learned in the course of our study is that the policy to have successful refugee claimants IVHP coverage ends 90 days after the acceptance of their refugee claim may also leave some people without publicly funded healthcare. So the assumption behind this 90 day policy is that um, you know, this 90 day window will typically be sufficient for a successful refugee claimant, so by this time they will become protected persons, to qualify for provincial or territorial health insurance. Right? In fact, in Ontario, for example, as soon as you become a protected person, then you should qualify for the Ontario health insurance plan. But that's not the case across Canada. Okay, so uh, let me give you an example um, that happened um, in Nova Scotia. I don't know if anyone in the audience is from Nova Scotia, but here is, um, here is a policy from that province concerning the eligibility for Nova Scotia health insurance program. Now, according to this provincial policy, um, refugee claimants who have been granted uh, pr protection here in Canada, in fact, are not eligible for provincial health care unless they can show that they have um, applied for permanent resident status. And the way to show that is by way of a letter from the IRCC that attests to the fact that they have applied for permanent resident status. Now, unfortunately, although all protected persons in Canada are eligible to apply for permanent resident status, not everyone is able to do that within that 90 day window. Um, some may not know how to fill out the required form to apply for a permanent residence and you know it might take them longer than 90 days to to either find some assistance or legal support to fill out those forms and for other people it might simply be a matter of finances right so it, it's not cheap to apply for um, permanent resident status um, it's 550 dollars for a refugee or the refugee couple and then $150 for each of the, the children right, on the application. So some people just may not be able to apply for permanent resident status for that reason. And because of that, you know, after the 90 days has expired, they will no longer have the interim federal health program. But then they, you know, in Nova Scotia, they're caught also under this policy that they in fact do not have provincial health insurance. And so they're, they're caught in between. Right, and we've been told stories about how they're at least a family or two, they're caught in that situation. Uh, 
Um, so the next thing that I'm going to say, so beyond just whom were left out from the interim federal health program, I also want to mention um, or touch upon um, some of the things that people told us in terms of some of the services that um, are, are not currently covered by interim federal health program, although in their, in their mind and that they believe um, this should be so. Um, so interpretation services, dental services, and mental um, health services are the three things that we heard most often from our interviewees about um, the service that are covered by the interim federal health currently um, as uh, incomplete. Um, and so when it comes to interpretation services, um, actually, I'm going to let Sufan, if you want to take this point about interpretation, and then I'll cover the rest. Sure, I get, I mean, in terms of interpretation, there's uh, two points really I wanted to mention. One is that IFHP covers lots of different services as we know. So post arrival health assessment is one service that is covered for refugees that are coming in and that are going to, that we know are um, going to become permanent residents. So the government assisted refugees, privately sponsored refugees. Um, so any resettled refugee category they are eligible for the post arrival health assessment because IFHP's rationale behind that is that they're going to stay here in Canada um, and you know move on to become citizens perhaps so for them we're going to do a full assessment and that's the post arrival health assessment refugee claimants on the other hand do not get that service so there's very few things that refugee claimants do not get otherwise everything's pretty equal now um, but post arrival health assessment or PAHA you might know um, are not covered for refugee claimants. And with the IFHP, two services that I'm aware of, um, you're able to claim interpretation services with in conjunction with the service. So PAHA is one and any mental health services. If you claim that through IFHP, you can also make a claim for um, requesting interpretation to go along with those services. Everything else, I don't know, you're supposed to, I guess, um, fund and find another interpreter or pay for it by through, through other means. But these two services, you can get interpretation covered. The challenge, though, is that the interpretation rate is a flat $28.95 per hour that they cover. Um, and so that from what I've seen in my experience, from that, what I know across Canada, you're not going to get um, any interpreter for twenty eight ninety five, any trained professional, you know, health interpreter for that cost. So, another you know barrier in accessing interpretation and accessing uh, equitable care. But this is the limitation; it hasn't changed since. Great, thank you. And so, so essentially, yeah, that's what we heard in our. Um, study. We've heard that, you know, for some of the services that are supposedly covered under IFHP, the, the range of its coverage, um, it, it's not broad enough. And even for those services within those types that are covered, um, how much um, the service providers are actually being reimbursed for the services actually um, kind of fall below the, the um, the, the market value, so to speak. Right? And so that deter uh, some service providers from willing to, to participate in the IFHP. So that's an example of the interpretation services. Now on the slide, I've also listed um, a quote from a, a participant that mentioned about um, dental coverage for um, their client. And it, it mentioned how the IFHP, um, you know, essentially took out nine teeth from this um, client, but didn't really cover anything for putting the, the, the teeth back, right? So that spoke to the fact that, you know, the dental coverage under the IFHP is quite limited. Uh, it's about emergency dental treatment. And so if you're in pain, it will cover your tooth extraction, but it does not cover the cost of tooth implementation, uh, implantation, right? Um, and and um, there are similar uh, gaps in, in terms of mental health and, and also physiotherapy. When it comes to mental health, um, 
Sipline will talk about this further um, you know, when we talk about the, um, the, the various benefit grids right, that specify which type of services are covered and to what extent. Now we know that not all mental health services are covered under the interim federal health program. The ones that are covered are you know, specific types of counseling. Right? Uh, and so that leave out such, such things as psycho, uh, psychosocial analysis, um, life skill training, expressive art therapy, and so forth, which have been found quite useful for some um, people experiencing trauma. And so, so again, you know, those are some of the complaints about the mental health piece. Um, lastly, just briefly want to mention uh, the physiotherapy part. Um, we're told that under the interim federal health program, again, it's funded um, in terms of how many um, service visits that you have per calendar year. I saw for, for interim federal health, uh, each person is entitled to, or each beneficiary is entitled to one initial assessment and then 12 subsequent visits within one calendar year. Now that's different from how some other provinces fund their physiotherapy um, through their provincial or territorial insurance program. For example, in Ontario, um, physiotherapists are funded um, by patient episode. That means for one particular issue, they will be given a, you know, a pocket of money, right? And it might take three visits to, to resolve that episode. It might take 12. It's just, it's the same amount of money for that issue to be resolved. Now there's pros and cons of how you fund um, physiotherapy, but some complaints uh, about the way that it's funded under the interim federal health program with a very strict limit in terms of how many visits is that let's say that it might take you, you know, 12 visits to resolve one issue, but that exhausts all your eligibility for physiotherapy for that entire year, right? You might, you know, suddenly get into a car accident, for example, and require uh, physiotherapy for, for that particular and a new issue, you won't be covered under the interim federal health program for that calendar year once you've exhausted all the um, services. Okay. Moving on beyond just gaps, he's also identified for us um, a number of barriers that impede um, people's effective and timely access to healthcare under the interim federal health. So we've heard a lot from the IVHP clients um, who say that they're often confused about what they're entitled to um, and, and for how long. This can be problematic for um, a number of reasons. One is that this creates um, an under expectation, if you will. Right? So we spoke to some people and then we'll tell them, well, what's your experience? We'll ask them, what's your experience with um, the dental coverage part of the IFHP? Or have you used, um, you know, have you seen an optometrist to, to get glasses and so forth? And they will say, well, they have no idea that they're actually eligible for those um, services under the IFHP, right? So that, that, that's what I mean by in terms of under expectation, because they just don't know that they actually qualify for you know, more than what they thought they would. But then there's also the opposite. Right? There's, you can also generate situations like over expectation, where some people, for some reason, um, believe that they are eligible for everything under the sun on the IVHP. And then, you know, it, become, it, it came as a surprise to some of them to learn that, well, they actually have to pay such things as over-the-counter um, medications, right? So a lot of people talk about having to pay for cough syrups, um, even though they felt that just, you know, they were told that medications are covered, right? But they didn't know that there's a difference between over-the-counter drugs and prescription drugs. And so, so that kind of confusion um, sometimes play a part in terms of what clients uh, can actually, um, or feel like they can access. And that meant that oftentimes they rely on their peers or um, service providers as a guidance on, you know, in terms of what they're entitled to. And that may result in IVHP clients sometimes simply accepting a service provider's words, right? They're sometimes perhaps erroneous, a claim that 
certain services are not covered. And they just take the provider's word for it because so they just don't know either. And even though maybe in theory, they should be entitled to those services because providers told them that they're not, then they just, you know, they just gave up, right? They just say that, oh, we're not covered and that's it. Um, just to illustrate this, what a participant referred to as the legacy of confusion, what I thought I would use um, as an example, the, uh, the confusion around um, the average P and its you know, uh, expiration date. Okay, so what I have on the slide here is, uh, um, it's, a, it's a part of a document called Refugee Protection Claimant Document, right, the RPCD, that for many refugee claimants double as um, a proof of their IVHP eligibility. Now, it used to be that, um, you know, between 2012, sorry, prior to 2000, prior to 2016, it used to be that there is an, um, there's a requirement that um, the IVHP cl uh, clients will have to renew their um, IVHP on an annual basis. And so on, their, on this particular document, it will show the, an effective date for their IVHP, but also a date that the IVHP will expire and um, the client will have to undertake to renew their IVHP eligibility every year. But that was changed in 2016 when the government um, changed the IVHP policy. One thing I did is to remove the need for clients to have to renew their uh, IFHP eligibility every year. And so again, you know, as I mentioned to you before, so long as the client, particularly for refugee claimants, so long as their, their case, their claim is still in the process before they hit one of those three kind of time markers um, where their, their uh, IFHP ends, during that process, they're all eligible. There's no need for them to reapply for IVHP per se. And yet, when we spoke to a, uh, to a number of um, refugees and service providers alike, they keep referring to this expiration date, right? And so what they're referring to, as I've shown um, on the slide, and I've circled that in red, is actually the expiration, the expiration date for the refugee protection claim and document. Right, this is what the document expires. Now, just because the document might have been expired, it doesn't mean that your IVHP expires at the same time. Okay, so those two are two different things. Now, obviously, um, because a lot of people use um, this document to show that they're qualified for IVHP, you know, it's, it's typically advisable, right, if you, you're document X expire, it's good to renew it and so that you will have an up-to-date um, uh, document that shows you're covered on your IVHP. But in theory, right, even if you have an expired document, you could still go to a service providers um, and, and access services on your IVHP because really at the end of the day, what the service providers need is the um, unique client identifier that's listed on the document, right? All they need to do is to key in that client ID and they'll be able to verify whether this person is covered under IVHP or not without having to rely on this paper and what it says. Um, and so, so that, that's, you know, really sold the seed of some confusion on the part of service providers and clients alike. Now, I just want to highlight this because this is pertinent in the current pandemic. Right. So, as many of you might know, under the current pandemic, the uh, IRCC is not um, processing any applications to renew um, the refugee protection claim and document. And so, instead, it has actually said to service providers that they should treat, uh, they should treat these expired RPCD, right, the refugee protection claim and document, as if they were still valid. Okay, and so um, this is particular in terms of what I just said is particular true right now, right? The client can take an expired um, refugee protection claim and document to a service provider and use that as, um, uh, as um, a documentation. 
that they're eligible for IHP. Um, just two more things I want to quickly mention. Um, another access barrier that IHP clients have told us concerns their difficulty finding um, providers that would actually assist IHP patients. And this seems to be particularly acute for um, people who are looking for family doctors and that they don't have any current um, connection um, to, to a family doctor, right? So for example, for some individuals who come to Canada and they already have relatives or friends in Canada, they were usually uh, able to find a family doctor through those existing connections. But for those refugee or refugee claimants who came to Canada without those pre-existing connections, it's particularly hard for them to find an IHP accepting um, family doctor. And that, that is not just limited to family doctor. We also heard um, issues with people having trouble finding pharmacists, dentists, home care services, and so forth. Right? And I, I won't read it, but on the slide, I also have a quote here um, from a participant who really had a hard time um, finding a family doctor. Right? It, it says it took him three months to find a family doctor who was willing to accept him. And this person happened to be living with HIV. And so you can imagine during that three months of time, it's, it's very difficult for this person because they need to have their prescription renewed and so forth. Okay. And sometimes when that happened, for a lot of um, clients, they internalize that as, as maltreatment, right? As either stigma or discrimination because they are refugees. Sometimes um, the provider's hesitancy to see IVH patients may um, relate to one of the things that we already talked about, which is the fact that they're paid less than what they could have got um, if, you know, if today they, um, they simply charge a client or they, they would be paid under, let's say, a private health insurance. Um, and sometimes um, it might mean that to, you know, to, to uh, make up the difference in terms of what they're paid under the IVHP and what they should have been paid under the market value, the difference, they actually charge that to client. And so we often hear that the clients are being asked to pay something out of pocket, even though um, their services should have been covered under the IVHP. And so one of the participants explained to us, for example, about uh, personal support workers, right? So IHP um, pays personal support workers in a home care setting um, at a flat rate of 2450. Uh, but um, according to this person, right, where they work, the minimum that they will pay um, a personal support worker is $28. And so they often will, pay, uh, will build a difference to the IHP um, client. And that is different from people's experience um, under provincial or territorial health insurance because we know that in those contexts, there are actually laws that prohibit what we know as extra billing or direct billing, right? Your service provider shouldn't, pay, uh, shouldn't bill you extra, right? If you use your provincial or territorial health insurance for things that should have been covered by the program, you shouldn't have been asked to pay extra. Now the same thing doesn't seem to apply under the IHP. Right? At best, what we found is you know, on their website, the IRCC's website, there is this kind of um, you know, a note right, that says, right, it, for things that are covered, you as a client won't have to pay for it. But oh, by the way, if you pay for it, there's no way for you to get your money back. And, but, but there's really not much repercussion for the service providers who actually charge clients um, that, that difference. So I think I'll conclude here and I'm going to pass the baton to uh, Sivan. Thanks, Wai. Sorry, could I jump in and ask a few questions? Because we have a bunch of questions and if I could sort of go through those before we move on so we don't forget <laughs> where they were in the presentation and all that. Because so some of them are sharing the slide. Uh, we can just keep the slide up and I'll ask the questions. Um, so can I just add, sorry, sure. I'm just going to add one point just on, on this topic, the direct billing. 
Um, so like YY mentioned, if you pay for it, if the client pays for it, they don't get it back. There's also once the client, for example, we had a client, he was a GAR, needed a wheelchair. Um, so they still had supplemental care under IFHP to cover equipments and whatnot, but they also had the Ontario Provincial Card. Um, so the Ontario Provincial Card gives you certain amount towards equipment. So he was eligible to get 80% covered for the wheelchair. Um, so the hospital, what they did was put it through the provincial coverage and the 20%, they were thinking they'd put it through IFHP. But IFHP doesn't do co-payments like that. So you either have to fully um, claim the whole amount from IFHP or nothing at all. So they didn't actually cover the 20% and um, we had to again advocate with the hospitals to reimburse the clients and, and then again submit the whole amount through IFHP. So there's little things like that as well um, to be aware of. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'll just get started. Um, so one question is, would the IFHP cover international students with temporary status? Um, not that I'm aware of, no. They, um, as far as the policy goes, international students um, is not one of the categories that it will cover unless the students, they decided to apply for refugee claim. Okay. Um, will dental treatment, eye exams, counseling services, and similar services that are covered by IFHP and not by provincial coverage still be covered after refugee claimants get their work permit? I'm assuming you're asking in the BC context? Yeah. Um, in that context, you should be, right? So just because uh, the BC covers the, the basic coverage portion, it doesn't cover the, um, the risk, so it should be covered. Um, I know that specifically, um, BC does not cover the medication part for the um, for, for the client for the refugee claimant, even when they have um, work permit, so the refugee claimant with work permit won't be eligible for BC's prescription drug scheme. They need to get prescription drugs through the IHP, um, and I'm assuming the risk is the same as well. Um, and there was a couple of questions about the expressive art therapy. Um, I think you mentioned that it was among the mental health services covered by IFHP, but the person asking the question mm. couldn't find this on the benefit grid. Right, so no, I, what I meant is expressive art therapy is one of those things that are excluded from IFHP. It's not considered part of the counseling services that will be funded by IFHP. Um, how could we know that the client has got provincial coverage after receiving their work permit while, while their IFHP hasn't expired yet? Sorry, can you repeat that? Please? Sure. Um, how could we, like, as the service provider, know that the client has got provincial coverage after receiving their work permit when their IFHP hasn't expired yet? Like, how would you go about knowing that they have like MSP? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the way it will probably work is that the client will have to apply for MSP, right? And then they will wait to receive their card and their health card, right? So before they receive their health card, they should, you know, I would think that they should still be covered under the IFHP. So there is that, that window period, right? So even though they're eligible for MSP and they're, they've applied for it, before they actually get the card, they can still use their IFHP. And so once they get the card, that will be their, their um, you know, um, proof of coverage under the uh, provincial program. Okay, great, um, thank you. I have one more question. Um, do clients have to apply for the IFHP or is it covered depending on their refugee status? Like, is it automatic or is it something they have to apply for regardless of their refugee status? Like if they're a GAR, claimant, PSR? So usually it's something that um, 
will come as part of your um, application. So, so for example, if you're, it does depend somewhat. So if you are GAR or you're you know, a privately sponsored refugees, um, when you come to Canada, when you arrive at the you know, port of entry, part of the package that they give you will be a bunch of documents and among them will be an IFHP certificate. Right? And so that you'll use that to show that you're covered under the IFHP. Now for refugee claimants is a little different um, and, and it also depends on where you go. Sometimes, um, you know, in, in theory, um, as soon as you, as I mentioned, as soon as you apply for a refugee status, that should trigger the IFHP. Um, and so sometimes, you know, if all goes well, you will have, so you, you have, let's say that you, it's a refugee claimant who come to Canada and at the port of entry that they will say that they want to apply for refugee status. They will do, they'll get an interview done to assess whether they're eligible. And if you're, if they're termed that they're eligible, then they will receive the, the document that I just mentioned, right? The, the refugee uh, protection claimant document. And that, that serve as their uh, proof of the IFHP uh, coverage. So you don't have to apply per se. And someone just um, made a comment. It says that also the IFHP will cover parts of the treatment that MSP does not cover. So the provincial, um, is, is that correct too? Um, well, it, it will depend on which kind of services we're talking about. And some, you know, sometimes there, there are differences between what provinces will cover and what, what um, the federal government will cover under IFHP. The important part is what Sifin just said, right? Even though for some things that are covered, um, you know, let's say it's covered by a provincial program, so it, it's covered by both, um, you just, you cannot do the coordination. Right? You have to choose one or the other. Okay. And then a follow-up, as somebody else has a question, it says, I've had refugee claimants with study permits who applied for MSP while not knowing that they could stay on the IFHP program and they had to pay for their MSP. So what do we do in this case? How do we cancel the MSP? I don't think you can. Um, the, the issue here is even if you don't apply for MSP, um, what in theory, what IFHP uh, would do is, you know, they will say that, look, you're eligible for MSP, right? And that, that means you're no longer eligible for interim federal health program. You don't actually have to apply for provincial health insurance, right? The, the, the criteria is that so long as you're eligible for um, those provincial programs, then you're no longer eligible for IHP. It's one or the other. Okay, great. Thank you for that little break for some questions. And then I'll pass it back to Safan, and then at the end, we'll do more questions too. Um, sure. So I'll mute myself again. And Safan, I'm going to stop sharing this, and so you can load your slide. And I also wanted to mention, I think someone is rustling papers and, and um, folks are hearing it. So I don't know, like, it, or you're touching your mic or I don't know what it is, but it just sounds like shuffling a little bit. Um, so I'll just, anyway, I'll mute myself. I just wanted to mention that. Just wanna check you guys are able to see my slide. Should say administration. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so thank you, YY. Um, I always learn something new whenever I hear you speak, so that's great. Um, so I'm going to be talking about, quickly, I'm going to go over the enrollment claims and ePay process. So this is particularly for service providers that are um, eligible to enroll with IFHP. So um, settlement workers, not so much, um, but mainly healthcare providers can uh, enroll. And so the process right now, I find it's quite easy because you can do everything online. In the past, um, it was a bit trickier, but I think what happens now is you just go on this uh, website, you can register online. Um, processing is quite easy. The time that it takes for you to get enrolled and set up can vary. I've had providers in my clinic 
that took, you know, a few days and some that had to wait weeks. I don't know why that is, but that is the case. Um, however, once you get a provider number, you can also now get a portal. So the portal is easy for you to submit claims. Um, you can see which claims are processed uh, and approved. And also you get a summary at the end. Um, that way you can check to see uh, if you're gonna be getting paid or not. Um, and now I think they've are also done this ePay um, uh, where you can get paid direct. You could always get direct deposit or you could choose to get uh, checks, but we'll just get to that in a bit. The provider portal um, is good because it gives you all the benefit grids. It gives you bulletins, so any updated information. Um, we've had IFHP at our clinic at the Auto Newcomer Health Center when I was working there, but I've, I've never received a fax or an email notifying of any changes. And these are major changes, you know, in terms of coverage, in terms of new services being provided, but I've never received any bulletins um, via fax. And they sometimes you can get it, sometimes you can't. So the best thing to do is to just go on the website and check on the, check the bulletins. You do not need to have um, a provider ID to check these benefit grids or bulletins or any updates. So um, at the end in one of the slides, I do have the link and you can go to, the, to get the resources without having to have a provider ID without needing to enroll into this. So that's, that's actually quite helpful because any sponsors, clients even can go and check out the benefit grid. You may not get um, a full understanding of whether or not you specifically will get that coverage based on where you are in the province or what a percentage of it will be covered for you, but you get a general idea of all the services that are covered under IFHP. And um, for me, like I'm not a healthcare provider, but looking at the benefit grid, I've been able to help a lot of clients understand what they can receive and will not receive. So once you enroll into uh, Medibee Blue Cross, you become one of their providers on their website. So um, now you can actually search on the website. IRCC used to have a, um, a site as well, listing all the providers across all provinces. Similar thing here, but you can actually look, um, it's much more user friendly. You can look with the search, filter it down to location, um, proximity to you, as well as the specialty of the service provider. The bad thing about this is that the list doesn't get updated. So unless you as a provider enroll and then call them back and deactivate, you're still gonna show up uh, on that provider list. So if you all of a sudden or any other provider decides that they no longer wish to provide services to refugee claimants, SCARs, and their name continues to be on there, if they do not call everybody else like us, we can go on and we will feel that, we will think that they'll continue to provide services to IFHP. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that when we get to challenges. So claims, again, um, if you're familiar with the program, there is a form once as a provider um, enrolled with IFHP, you have a claim form. So when you provide the service, clients fill it out, or you fill it out, the admin office fills it out. Fairly straightforward. Uh, and at the bottom, you have a section where the provider signs and then the client signs. Now, then what happens now is that you can actually submit this claim directly into the portal. You can either even upload it, scan it in, or you just keep track of it um, by yourself. So what we used to do at our clinic is to upload the forms into the client's chart. And in this portal, we would just manually enter, you know, this type of service that the clients got, the client's information, and really it takes about 30 seconds to submit a claim to see if they're even eligible for that service. So it's very good um, in terms of that. You can also still fax your claims in or mail it, but I wouldn't recommend it because I've had lots of issues with that. Uh, either things get lost or there's really a lot of delays and then the IFHP or the Medivy Blue Cross offices seem to not, it, it goes to different people, um, different uh, individuals process those faxed claims and then you may not get an answer quickly or even check what's happening with the claim. So I find that doing everything online through this portal makes it easier because you can keep track of it. Um, like I mentioned, you can look at the benefit grids even be, without having been registered with IFHP, uh, with Medivy Blue Cross, sorry. 
um, but only specific providers can actually uh, check whether or not a specific client has coverage for a service and, and all the details, like the specifics of it. So if I was to, um, if I was a mental health service provider and I'm seeing a client and the client has questions about dental services, even though I have a provider number, I can go in perhaps and check, but without having a specific fee code or a service code, for that, for dental services, I may not even be able to provide answers to that client sitting in front of me. So it does get a little bit complicated when you're looking for that. So the benefit grid is helpful, gives you a general idea, but if you want more specifics um, and if you really want to go in and check on a client, because that's what IFHP requires you to do um, day to day, the client's coverage could change. I've never seen that, but any anytime, let's say, once you become eligible for provincial services and IFHP becomes aware of that and you're no longer aware of IFHP, it's not like the client will get a notification or you will get a notification as a service provider unless you go in and check for that, um, check in the portal or call IRCC, uh, IFHP to check for that. So it can get a little confusing if you don't or it can be difficult to get specific answers if you don't have a provider number and a fee code so those are two things that you must have but the benefit group again gives you a general idea um, communicating with ircc i found challenging uh, and they're the administration administrators of the program ifhp program medivy blue cross covers the insurance part and the billing and all of that you won't get you know, if you call them and say, is my client covered for this? Why aren't they covered for this? Their claim is improper. None of that answer questions they'll be able to answer. They can only answer, give me your client's name, give me the UCI number, I'll check if they're covered or um, um, if the claim can be put through or not. So basically what they're doing on their end is what you can do with the portal is you put the client's information, the fee code, and then you'll get an answer of whether they're covered or not. The details around why they're covered or not they're covered, when would they be covered, when did it expire, all those details, Medivy Blue Cross reps will not be able to answer. Um, so the number that I provide here is the Medivy Blue Cross phone number. I've had very good um, communication with the representatives in terms of getting connected really quickly. Uh, once again, if a claim isn't um, processed, like once I submit a claim and I get a bounce back, I would call that number to see what happened. They can provide a high level answer. So if, for example, oh, we've never received this claim or it got lost, whatever the case is, they can give you that high level and then you can then resubmit the claim. So, you know, it, it is helpful. In terms of connecting with IRCC, I've, I've, it's been challenging. I've had to do that once in a while because of um, our providers weren't getting the right type of, uh, you know, the, the, there was problems with the type of services they'd be eligible to provide um, claims for or submit claims for. And so issues with that, I had to connect with IFHP and there was a lot of emails back and forth, uh, sorry, with IRCC. And so that can be challenging and it could be another deterrent for service providers to, you know, um, provide services to clients with IFHP. And finally, I mentioned ePay. Um, again, you can track this online. Uh, any, and ePay is um, beneficial for those individuals that are willing, to, that are looking to get paid right away, but also for clients. Um, it, it's, it's more helpful for other programs because Medivy Blue Cross covers not only IFHP, but they cover you know, services for veterans and whatnot. So it's more beneficial for clients who can directly um, claim services to Medivy. Part of it will be covered and uh, another portion the client pays. But for IFHP, uh, our clients will not need to do that. Um, I think we've covered most of this here. I'll go on to coverages and uh, mainly I'll talk about the uh, updates for now that the IFHP has provided. YY has covered some of the updates already, so I'll just add on um, from there and I'll quickly go over the benefit grids a little bit. So this portion may be relevant, like I said, you can access benefit grids and guides um, without being a registered um, provider, so it could be for the sponsors and beneficiaries as well. 
So since post, uh, since 2016, a lot has changed since the reinstatement of interim federal health program. However, I mentioned that pre-departure uh, medical services are covered as well. That includes an immigration medical exam. Now, immigration medical exam may also be required once the refugee claimant comes to Canada. And one thing to note here is only specific registered physicians are able to do the immigration medical exam. So again, there's, um, I'm from Ottawa, so in Ottawa, I think we have about six to eight physicians that are able to provide this service. And the immigration medical exam, um, you're actually covered for only once. So if a refugee claimant needs, needs to do another immigration medical exam uh, for their hearing purposes, they'll have to pay for a second or third one out of pocket. So other than the immigration medical exam pre-departure, you get vaccinations as well that's covered. Um, and clients are actually, for the most part, coming with vaccination records now. In the past, we've had some difficulty getting clients, um, uh, receiving those vaccination records. Um, but, and then so we would have to start the series again once they come to Canada. But now we're seeing that the vaccinations that they're receiving pre-departure um, were actually, and they match with the schedules here, we're actually getting some of those records with the clients, which is very helpful. Um, and they're also, the pre-departure medical services also cover some treatments. So for example, um, TB medications, syphilis, they'll, they'll cover those kind of treatments there as well. Once you come to Canada, some of the things that have changed, and I think for mental health services, for the most part, there's been actually a lot of advocacy um, in expanding what's covered in mental health services. So although there's still some challenges with regards to you know, the specific um, therapies that are covered, like why I mentioned, some of the things that have changed, um, just basic psychotherapists are able to register now, social workers are able to register now. In the past, they wouldn't be able to provide uh, services and, and submit claims to IFHB. So that has changed, which is great. Um, however, you do still need a physician or a nurse practitioner's uh, prescription for those services. So the client, uh, how it would work is a client would need to see a physician or a nurse practitioner, get a prescription for um, seeing, seeking mental health services with the psychotherapist or social worker, uh, psychologists, uh, and then the psychotherapist, when they are submitting the claim, then they would uh, include the prescription with that claim. And that's how they would uh, they could get covered for those services. Um, I mentioned the bulletins, which is great to keep track of. Um, so that's something that's something that was wasn't there before on the portal. Uh, mainly, they had the benefit grids, but now it includes the bulletins that are really good. So it updates you on anything that's changing. Finally, um, something that has changed, and that's, you know, to my surprise, it's changed before the pandemic, but it's very much needed now, is um, physicians and nurse practitioners, if they're doing virtual visits, so over the phone or video, so uh, providing services over the phone or video, then they had a special code for that as well, and they could submit so that they could get um, services covered. So those are some of the highlights that um, I've pulled from the bulletins, but from our experience as well. Um, and I'll cover what's more updates just shortly in the next slide. So in terms of the benefit grids, if you go to the following link, um, I think what I'll, I can do this. I can show you actually where to find these resources. Are you still able to see? No, it doesn't show you that. Um, sorry. There you go. Are you able to see the website now? Okay, perfect. So that link there, once I clicked it, it takes you to this website. It does say health professionals. You can kind of ignore that um, because you can access this without being a health professional. What I would do then is click on the Immigration, Refugee, and Citizenship Canada, um, select that, and then you have two options to see if you're looking to see if somebody's um, covered for services in Canada, you would click here, um, or you can also see what's, what they're covered for outside of Canada, so the pre-departure medical services I was talking about. Here you have all of these bulletins, you know, um, that we mentioned, and these are the benefit grids. Now, what they've recently done is 
they have um, categorized or organized these benefit grids based on the year that they've updated it. So if you look in 2020, they've updated, updated the supplemental coverage and added some benefit grid. But if you have to kind of scroll down to look for the basic grid. So actually the basic coverage, that grid wasn't even, wasn't updated recently. The last update was 2017. So you may have to scroll down a little bit to see um, all of the benefit grids, but they're all here um, for you to access and you don't have to know like we mentioned. I will now go back to the presentation. Okay, so that was in a nutshell, just the benefit grids. One thing to note, when you open up any benefit grid, really the notes are really helpful at the bottom um, and they kind of give you information of what is covered, what is not covered a little bit more in detail. Um, if you go, it, it can look a little daunting, it, it, you know, with all the grids, but if you, if you go through the little sections, um, it's fairly easy to read and understand, but more so for healthcare professionals who are, with, who are providing that service and understand those fee codes and whatnot. Okay, so, and we're happy to answer any questions about the benefit grids um, later on as well. I'm just going to move ahead um, with uh, the COVID-19 updates. So, although the physicians and nurse practitioners had the ability to claim for virtual services, psychotherapists and mental health providers didn't have that fee code. So until um, recently, they actually weren't able to claim for those virtual care services. Perhaps they weren't doing as many and IFHP wasn't aware of it. But since the pandemic, um, psychotherapists, any kind of mental health service providers are able to claim for virtual services as well. So that's been a, an update and change. Um, you can actually now, it's, it's um, one of the bulletins claim that you can actually easily replace uh, lost documents or perhaps as YY mentioned just use the expired documents that's allowed because offices are closed right now and you can't go in person to get those documents so that's one change another change is that because of the process has changed and refugee claimants are not able to do a lot of things in person there is a third document that they that they have been IRCC has introduced it's called the refugee um, acknowledgement of claim and notice to return for interview so just to add to the confusion a person um, can have one of these three documents and if they do you'll know that they have IFHP so it's good, the IFHP, the Interim Federal Health Certificate is the most common one that I am that I see because all, all the guards, the private sponsored refugees will have that document and it's fairly straightforward. You know right away that it is IFHP. Um, it is only talking about the health insurance. Um, but if you look at the other two documents, that is where the confusion starts because you can have two different expiration dates. Um, it'll have information about the refugee claimant, the uh, protection process uh, or the that's the document main document but in the little uh, notes at the bottom you'll also see that they have IFHP and there's the note about interim federal health coverage at the bottom so it just um, you know the 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 main challenge that we've always hear from service providers is that I never know what kind of coverage they have or I don't know if they have coverage because the documents don't make sense they're confusing well there's still three different documents for you that you can come across. So it doesn't reduce the confusion, but to knowing that IFHP doesn't expire is helpful. And knowing that refugee claimants no longer have to reapply every year to, uh, to get IFHP is also helpful. So one thing that you can remember is one of these three documents, if you see them, then you know that they still, they have IFHP or they're el eligible to have IFHP. And all you then will have to do as a service provider enrolled with MetaV is to just put in their num uh, UCI number and check to see um, uh, for their specific coverages. Another thing that's changed now, this is something that um, we've discovered, but it's not actually in the bulletins or on their website. So like I mentioned, you will need to submit a claim form whenever you provide services and you wanna get paid. 
clients would have to sign that portion at the at the bottom along with your uh, with the provider signature since the pandemic and because a lot of people are providing virtual services you no longer need a client signature so in the portal it's even easier like i said it's all manual you don't need to upload this scanned claim form but if you do you can um, but what we were doing is just manually typing in you know requesting the claim through that portal and we don't need to we don't need a client signature but we would still just scan the unsigned document into the client's chart like our own electronic medical record system um, and that's just that will cover you for any audit um, that uh, MetaV Blue Cross does decide to do um, in the future. So client signature you no longer need uh, to submit claims, which is very helpful. You don't during a pandemic, especially you don't want to be tracking down clients and trying to get their signature. Um, and finally, this is uh, one point that actually YY brought up is that, and I think he's already covered it a bit. Because of all the confusion, a lot of service providers will tell you, um, "No, I'm not going to see refugees, or I'm not going to serve um, clients who have IFHP." because there's a number of things that happened in the past, the cuts and all of that, and not all service providers um, get the updated information from IFHP or IRCC to know what's actually happening. So you could get that, um, and that we've seen that, but you could also uh, get, because of the pandemic, there's been also changes in uh, appointments. So medical appointments, either they were if they were classified non-essential, they were, they're being postponed or canceled. And some of your clients may feel that they're being canceled or postponed because of their immigration status, but that may not be the case at all. So um, sometimes client will come to you and say, oh, because I'm a refugee or because I have IFHP, I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, my appointment was canceled. And they may make that link, but it could not be the case, especially during this time. So it's worthwhile to you know, check again with the service provider exactly why the appointment was canceled or postponed. So some common challenges, um, and we've already covered some of these, that only enrolled providers can spe check specific eligibility coverages in the portal. Um, and once paid, clients do not get reimbursed. We've already kind of uh, covered that. I think most of it was covered. Uh, provider list is outdated, like we mentioned, and um, there's different challenges for that. I think Bahar mentioned some of these uh, challenges already, and I'll just go on to actually uh, provide some tips on how, what we have done in the past. So in terms of advocacy, the, a lot of frontline workers are having to do that, whether it's um, individual one-on-one -on -one cases, like I spoke about the, you know, the child being born in Canada and we had to advocate on behalf of the mother to get a bit more funding from um, RAP. But also uh, settlement workers I know have connections with immigration officers, which is really helpful when it comes to those one-on-one -on -one cases. Immigration officers actually, we have been able to, you know, provide some cases and challenges on medication that wasn't covered, for example, and we were able to get a little bit more funding or whatnot for the client. So having that relationship is very important. YY and I have brought uh, some issues forward to IRCC um, and met with some of those, uh, the staff there, which I think, you know, helped in some ways because they were not aware of all the challenges that we had seeing on the ground, like mental health services, you know, not having enough providers being covered or, uh, issues with dental care. So uh, it's really important for you if you have the opportunity to bring that up to uh, IRCC or their representatives. I would suggest creating your own network or a list of providers who um, accept IFHP. That's what we've been doing at the clinic. Our admin support um, constantly, you know, from time to time we'll do an environmental scan to see if there are providers that are accepting IFHP and if not why not because that will identify um, an opportunity for us to provide some education and perhaps encourage the providers to sign on or enroll to IFHP. Um, we also include every time at the at the clinic that I used to work at um, when when clients move on to let's say find they find a family doctor and they move on to different providers or 
if you were to refer them on to specialists or send them off to get diagnostics and imaging on the cover letter of um, you know of the requisition or whatnot we would include that the client has ifhp so just a note saying that they have they're covered under interim federal health program services that you provide are covered under that so especially if they don't have the provincial and territorial health card this is information that's helpful for the provider so that they know not to charge the client to, to process it through ifhp um, and we also provide some links to you know i the meta blue cross portal so that they um, can, if they're not already signed up for it, that they can sign up for it and provide that service so the client doesn't have to pay for the services. Um, when uh, the Syrian refugees arrived in 2015, 2016, we actually um, engaged a lot of volunteers to be doing some of these work. So we don't have time, and I know most of you on this panel probably are service providers who don't have time to do this education. This is not really our responsibility. Um, perhaps Medivy Blue Cross should be, or IRCC should be doing this, but the uh, reality is that we are, as service providers and providing service to this population, have to do a lot of this outreach ourselves. So we engaged volunteers who uh, ended up going to different pharmacies, um, dental clinics, especially in the areas that we know our clients were moving into, uh, these newly arrived refugees. And we were encouraging those pharmacies to either sign on or provide a little bit of uh, support in, in um, educating them about IFHP so that the clients can have an, uh, you know, an experience that's, that's, I mean, they're already going through a lot coming into a new country. This is not something that they would have to deal with, especially because they're covered. You know, the IFHP gives you all these wonderful coverages, um, but service providers are just not aware of it. So we engage volunteers to do those kind of outreach um, and education sessions. Similar to what we're doing now, we've done it with, we've provided more information to our colleagues as well. I And I think that I'll just, perhaps end on that note that education um, is probably going to be very important in your role, not only um, with the clients, because when clients come, like YY mentioned, among with a lot of papers, they're not really given the tools to understand how IFHP works. A lot of the times they don't even know that they got another health you know, coverage during this time um, and what it, they don't even know what it's covered. Um, so it's upon the service providers really to educate the clients about what's covered, what's not, and to, and what we do as a, as a quick reminder is to just say, anytime you go to any medical services or labs or imaging, take your IFHP certificate with you and just show them that at the, at the clinic or office. So that's one, like, it's like a, you know, one rule that we just make sure we continue to um, educate clients on that and just a reminder to show the IFHP document wherever they go for their medical services. Um, another thing that we do, um, you know, I've actually reached out to IRCC before because I was doing a similar presentation to my colleagues and um, they said, oh, you know, you're not really supposed to do this they could just go on our website i'm like yeah but i'm calling you because the website doesn't have this information you know and you are welcome to come and do a presentation for service providers but then i never heard back from them um so this is why we end up um, doing a lot of these education or webinars for uh service providers it's because there isn't enough that the ircc has done i think i've attended in the 10 years that i've been working with this population only one webinar from IRCC covering IFHP, which was very helpful, but they just don't do it enough. And so then it becomes, um, you know, it's up to us to educate ourselves. Learn from this website. The website is helpful right now. It's updated and it's nice and user friendly. So um, educate yourself, keep updated on the bulletins and the updates. Um, and I would say engage volunteers to do some of those outreach and education perhaps with you. Um, and one thing that YY does as well is educating future professionals um, and so they can become advocates and uh, IFHP providers in the future. That's it from us and we'll take questions now. These are our contacts if you do need to reach out to us in the future. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Um, we do have some more questions, so I'll jump right in. Um, I'll just share my screen real quick. Um, uh, <laughs> um, so the question that we have is, what's included in the dental coverage? And I, I think you mentioned this already, YY, but I think maybe people want a little more detail about that. Is that that uh, question directed at me? Yes, I, yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I would suggest that you just go to the, um, the benefit grid, specifically the, the dental care benefit grid. It's literally just two pages and it will show you everything that is, that is actually covered for dental. Again, it's not allowed. Most of these are if, uh, emergency dental care. Uh, I think you mentioned that it was extractions, but not implantation of right. the. Um, right. So a lot of so yeah, it covers um, extractions. It covers, you know, some kind of repair for um, denture or anesthesia required to do some of these dental surgery. But again, it's it's very very minimal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Another question is: Are mental health services only to be provided by regulated professionals? For instance, counseling in BC is not regulated at this time, or can unregulated professionals provide services to under IFHB? So if you look at the benefit grid, actually, it'll tell you um, who is able to and who's not able to. Um, I believe it has to be, they have to be licensed uh, and registered professionals. So if, if they're unregulated, I don't think they're going to be able to register with IFHP or enroll with MetaB Blue Cross. So then they wouldn't be able to submit claims. Um, I mean, you can certainly provide services if you're part of, you know, a non-for-profit or um, community health center you're providing free services anyways, but um, as an individual provider, you will not be able to submit claims. Um, okay, this is a bit of a longer one, but due to the pandemic, um, it is extremely difficult to find an MD or an NP to make counseling referrals and mental health uh, diagnosis. Is there something that can be done in terms of advocacy to collectively ask IRCC to maybe stop asking for these referrals? Um, because, because it's a, you know, a difficult time due to the pandemic. Is there something else that can be done? I mean, we, yeah, I, we should continue to advocate for this. We can bring it up with IRCC for sure. Um, the email address you've shared, you can share it with the, you can, you can suggest that they do this, but um, speaking with Medivy Blue Cross is not going to get you anywhere. I would talk to IRCC reps um, or immigration officers and bring this up again. A lot, of, a lot has changed, um, which is great, but it did take a long time to make those changes. I think when YY and I met with IRCC reps, I, I believe it was like three years ago. Um, so, and we're now seeing some of the changes. And like, I'm not saying our advocacy efforts worked, maybe it just you know happened that it came about three years later, but um, know that it will take some time to change some of that. I think nurse practitioners weren't even allowed to prescribe it. They weren't accepting those prescriptions in the past and now they are. So it will take some time to um, change any of that. However, I'm going to share with you guys in the chat um, an email address so that you can actually connect with IFHP directly. I've had, you know, it may take some time to get a response. Um, sorry, I don't know if I shared that with everybody. Oh, no. Okay. I'll, I'll share it. Yeah. Uh, um, so that's an, that's, um, an IFHP IRCC email mm -hmm. and you're free to, this is what I actually got the email address I got from a webinar that IRCC provided. 
And so they said, if you have any issues, email them and they'll connect. And, you know, I've had even a chance to connect with upper management through that email. So perhaps this is something that we could all try. Um, and the more we bring this up and more individuals that bring it up as a barrier to access services, I think um, we may see some changes, not right away, but definitely worth a shot. Yeah, and I've also, um, for this presentation, I contacted IRCC through that email and did get a phone call, which was uh, like one of those 1866 numbers. So I thought it was spam, but it wasn't. <laughs> it was an actual person. I was like, ah, and then, and then I didn't hear back. But after that, um, we did have the discussion of like, okay, this is the webinar, this is the need. So they do know that this webinar is, you know, happening and why. Um, so okay so next question is um so thank you for your very informative presentation just to clarify so as soon as the provincial health coverage care is activated the ifhp automatically stops even if expiry date covers a longer period is that it should but again you know i think it um the, the ircc are not they're not always very on top of this. They're not really tracking it very closely. So it's possible that you might have, you, you can still um, people type in their client ID um, and then we'll still show that they're eligible for IHP. Um, so, you know, that's why on that, on that document, right, in the bottom where it shows that, um, you know, they have IHP coverage and also where you as a, refugee claimant you're supposed to sign, and it says that I undertake to inform the IRCC when my eligibility or my immigration status is changed, right? And so, so they rely on you to actively tell the IRCC that, oh, look, I now have, let's say, you know, uh, um, the uh, medical services plan in BC, so I no longer require IHP. I doubt very much that people do that, so it's possible you could have both. It's just that what I was presenting is what it's supposed to happen. Um, but, you know, again, uh, even if you do that, uh, you can still have um, the, you know, the, the um, supplemental coverage part of the IHP, even if you have the provincial coverage for the basic part. Great. Um, another question is, a registered service provider can be an individual or can it also be a clinic slash organization? So I guess the person making referrals. So in the past, you could actually register as a clinic, but very recently they've moved away from that um, and they actually require that each provider within a clinic registers themselves. So, um, you could get grandfathered in, for example, for the clinic that I used to work at, we have a clinic provider number. And then more recently now, we're getting all of our providers slowly um, registered. But those, some of the providers, such as our nurse practitioners, nurses that were covered under the clinic number are still covered under the clinic number. So I imagine though that any new, um, like from now on, you can only register individual providers within a clinic, not the entire clinic. Um, okay, if there are any more questions, I think I have most of them done. Um, there's a couple more. So one other question that we received previously um, about the IFHP is, I think you mentioned this, is that there's a list of providers, but a lot of them, once someone tries to go there to get service, um, they turn them away. And there's a number of reasons. It could be like a, a, there's a new front desk person that doesn't know, so they just say no automatically. Um, but I guess in your opinion, in your experience, how do you um, kind of mitigate this? How do you go around this? How do you tell the, you know, special, like the doctor that specializes in like diabetes or whatever it is, and they're on the list, so we really need the service. Can you please provide this service? Is there any tips or tricks you have for service providers? Um, I don't know why, why, if you have any tips, like from, from my point of view, what we've done is we've tried to encourage, call the clinic, talk to the provider if we can. 
um, and just get a sense of why they're no longer providing that service. Perhaps whoever called didn't get the right answer or didn't ask the right question. So we call and see, you know, what is the reason behind you not um, accepting clients who have IFHP? And we get a number of different answers. So we get things like, oh, I, you know, refugees don't get coverage anymore, you know, because they're just not updated um, on the differences that between the different refugees uh, or this is the reinstatement of the coverage. They're not aware of that one. Two, um, because in 2012 the cuts took place and there was so many confusion about some clients get coverage, some type of refugees get this kind of coverage, others get a different type of coverage. And then you hear in the media also that, um, or just among you know, colleagues at that time, you, know, you don't get your claims uh, approved on time, you don't get, there's payment delays and all this other myths. And some of them are true, obviously, they're from true experiences. They hear about all of these things and service providers will say, you know, it's too much of a headache, uh, it's way too complicated. There's a lot of administration. This is why we don't want to go. We don't want to provide services anymore. Now, yes, you know, there's some truth to that, of course, but as a service provider or an advocate for refugees, I would suggest saying, you know, there is a new portal now. Things are a bit easier. Um, would you reconsider providing services to refugee claimants? You are still on their website. You're listed on as a provider. So, um, if they really don't want to do that and don't want to provide services, just recommend that they take their name off the list because it does create confusion for sponsors and other community members looking for services. Um, but yeah, other than that, other than encouraging service providers to do that, you really, there's nothing I would say IRCC or anybody else could do. They don't want to see my FHP holders. And if, if they do want to be taken off the list, they have to contact IRCC or do they contact Pacific? Yeah, they would contact Meta B Blue Cross. Blue Cross, okay. Um, okay, I have another question. Can a hospital be a service provider without everyone working there having to individually register? That's a really good question. Again, I, um, I'm not familiar with that the billing department would know the answer to that i like i said again in the past you could be registered as a hospital right so most hospitals perhaps are already registered as hospitals and since the changes have happened you know it doesn't really apply to them um so they may have a different uh way of doing that so it, from my experience um when i had to deal with any hospitals in terms of billing issues um, they'd never, I don't think they, from my end, they had to look at which specific provider provided that service. So I, I feel like the hospitals have a different way of doing that or figured it out differently, or maybe they were registered before the new changes took place. So sorry, can't really answer that question. Um, next question is where can we get the list of the IFHP providers? So on the current website that I just showed in the resources. Um, you have to do a little bit of digging, but in the search option, all I did was put, you know, healthcare providers or IFHP providers, and you have a section that, um, you know, looks at, uh, has a drop down list. So I'm going to try to see if I can find it. You can perhaps move on to a different question and I'll try, unless why, why you have the answer. I just type a link to the chat. If oh, okay. You, okay. That, you should be able to find a bunch of. Um, it's separated by provinces, so it will see you will see um, you know up to date well somewhat up to date up to September twenty twenty in terms of list of providers in each province. Okay, great. Okay, and I just shared it with all attendees um, in the chat box. So if you open that, and I'll also put it on the hub when I share the. Um, the slides and the video, I'll put all these resources in there as well. Um, we have a question that's more broad and, you know, feel free to give your opinion. Um, do we know how the IFHP specifically affects women in Canada? Sorry, what was that? Do we know how the IFHP specifically affects women in Canada? Like, is there, um, a different experience 
for women? Is there extra barriers that they face? Is it more adversely affecting women? For example, that we had another um, example given by another um, attendee that said um, that a woman gave birth in Canada and then her child wasn't covered, but she was covered. So, so instances and cases like that, does the IFHP impact women differently? I haven't come I, across I, think I can just, you know, off the top of my head, I can think that, and there are some um, differences, but I don't know if it's systemic, but um, in terms of what we heard in our research, we've heard um, quite often that there's some problems with respect to um, the kind of the child delivery piece, whether or not that is covered. And sometimes some hospitals may say, oh, no, uh, we're, we're not going to cover that. And you perhaps is better off going to uh, midwives. Um, so, so we do encounter that, even though in theory, uh, IF, IFHP should cover the cost of um, delivery. Um, but for some reason, we've been hearing some stories about um, hospitals either charging people for it or addition, in addition to what you know, they would get from IHP or they would just say outright and we're not going to provide that service. Hmm. Hmm. And would you suggest maybe the client checks with the hospital before um, like their due date? Like what, what do you suggest would be something that service providers can support you know, their clients and yeah. yeah. No, usually what we've heard, so you know, in our research, we specifically tried to find um, uh, refugee and refugee claimants who identified as women and see what their health experience has been like. Now, there are those experiences I just mentioned that were somewhat negative, um, but we also have people who told us you know, they have you know, very successful experience uh, interacting with IFHP and you know, everything was covered under IFHP and they were pretty happy about it. Um, what I personally found was to, you know, the difference is that for those individuals, they usually have some kind of advocate working with them, right? So for, for example, they might have already have a, a family doctor um, or they have, you know, perhaps some health navigator that they're working with. And these individuals who are able to, to you know, do a bit more pushback, right? And when the hospitals um, say no to them, they're more able to, to say, well, you know, can you kind of reconsider that? decision. Um, and so I would suggest, you know, perhaps don't go to the hospitals, um, you know, wait, put it off and wait until uh, the, the, when you're very close to your due date to contact the hospitals, perhaps, you know, it's better to, to have, you know, to, to contact the hospitals way ahead of time to assess whether or not they will, they, you know, whether or not they're willing to cover you under the IHP um, and also get your, um, uh, allies involved, whether it's your, you know, uh, health navigator, whether it's your, um, you know, se settlement workers, or even your family doctor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, to add to that, we have a comment that says there are gendered inequity issues with accessing care. Women tend to be responsible for family health, so this may impact women differently. So I think that's more of a like a broader topic that can be discussed. Um, much longer and you know research can be done on this um, but overall I think that covers all of our questions for today so thank you both very much we're about 10 minutes early finishing our webinar today um, we oh, we answered over approximately 25 questions so thank you everyone for sending your questions and staying with us till the very end of the presentation that's always nice um, and uh, a big thank you to our presenters, Safan and YY, who are joining us from Ontario today. Um, so their time difference, um, it's probably dinner time now. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for jumping in and supporting us here in BC, um, giving us all your information, your experience. I think it's been really helpful and eye-opening. Um, my experience with IFHP was when I was with uh, and part of a sponsorship group and it was so difficult to find specialists um, and we had seven people and we had like two people um, just designated to like call the list and hopefully find 
uh, a primary caregiver and then the specialist that the, the person needed. So um, yeah, it was, this was helpful for me and I'm sure a lot of service providers watching. Um, for everyone watching, I'm gonna be posting the video, uh, the PowerPoint deck and all the resources that Safan and YY shared with us today right on the BC Refugee Hub. Once it's posted, I'll email everyone directly, all the registrants. Um, we had over um, 150 registrants today, so I wanna make sure everyone gets this information and they can um, watch the video later on and also share with your staff um, and also use it as an onboarding tool because I know there's a lot of changes in staffing, so this would be a great tool to um, get your new staff to watch the, the recorded video um because there's a lot of really great information especially about the history because i think a lot of people come into the sector and we kind of learn quickly about ifhp but there's no history or how did it come about or you know all this all these things um and then i'll also be sending out an evaluation form to everyone so if you could please take five minutes to fill it out it's usually about five or six questions um and also just a plug for my BC Refugee Hub newsletter. If you could scroll to the bottom of the website, there's a little box and you just have to join the mailing list by putting in your email address there. And then every time we have a new webinar or I update with um, like videos from the trainings, uh, it all goes to our mailing list as well. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you again, Safan and YY. Um, and I'll, yeah, thanks so much.